Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. It's time to do another viewer request video and I've been putting this one off for a couple years. Um, people have been asking me to do it for a while. So it's going to be how to drive a Caterpillar D2. So I've got the 5U out here and uh, this is kind of the later series D2. The earlier J series D2s are going to be similar to this. Some of the controls like the throttle might be in a little bit different spot but for the most part this will apply to all Caterpillar D2s. And everybody, please bear with me. The D2 is looking pretty dirty. I've had it out here for about the last month and the dirt and the dust and the rain and everything else. So it's not as clean as it probably should be, but it is a working machine, right? So I think we'll start by doing an overview of the controls. And to do that, it's gonna be easiest if I just climb up into the operator's position. Now I'm about 6'2 without my boots on. And it is a bit cramped on a D2. Um, you can see my toes go underneath the brake pedals. So to get them up on the pedal, I really have to pull back, lift up, and then I can finally actuate them. But the taller you are, the harder it's going to be to fit on one of these. So let's start with the throttle. This is your throttle lever. And right now it's in the shutoff position because there's a rather stiff detent in here about midway through its total arc of travel right here. And once you can overcome that detent, that is the fuel on mode. And uh, all the way back is going to be wide open throttle. Forward up against the detent is low idle. To shut it off, you push it back forward past the detent again. That's fuel off. Now, this trips up a lot of new D2 owners because they're not aware that the range of travel you have ahead of that detent is going to be fuel off position regardless of where this is. So when they're starting or when they're trying to start their machine for the first time and they don't realize that there's a detent in there, they're thinking this is your effective range of throttle. And what they'll do is they'll be cranking the diesel and cranking the diesel, nothing's responding. Finally, they get mad and just give it a good pull. It slams past the detent and the diesel engine takes off and is running and they have no idea what just happened. Um, that's been on the forums quite a bit. So that's one thing you're gonna wanna watch out for on these. Basically, like I said, past that detent, this is all fuel off right here, it does nothing. Next, we have this lever all the way over here on the left. This is the main clutch. And the way this works is all the way back, the clutch is engaged, all the way forward, the clutch is disengaged. Now this is an over center clutch. So to disengage it, this has a detent as well. You can hear that snap. That's what releases the clutch. Now to re-engage the clutch, you would pull it back and again, overcome that detent, lock it in. This thing is locked in. You don't have to touch that lever again until you need to disengage the clutch to change gears. Uh, here's your gear shifter down here. So this main clutch lever has an interlock mechanism attached to it so that anytime the clutch is engaged, it's gonna block the shifter out from going into any gear. So to get it into gear, you disengage it. Now, if you were not moving and you're trying to put it into a gear from neutral, there is also a clutch brake that's attached to this lever. And what you would do is push it ahead toward the firewall with some tension on it that engages the clutch brake and basically stops all of your transmission gears from spinning so that they will not clash when you try to engage a gear. So with your forward pressure on the main clutch lever, you can then engage a gear and creep the clutch lever back. It's going to start grabbing and the, the machine will start moving. Let's lock it in to snap it in place and then you are locked in gear and those interlocks are working again to keep you from popping it out of gear anytime the clutch is engaged. So that's one thing to be mindful of. That interlock usually works on these just about all the time. So, you know, basically you just repeat the process to take it out of that gear, disengage your clutch, pop it into neutral, re-engage the clutch again. You do not want to let these sit in idle with this main clutch disengaged. It will wreck your clutch disc eventually. So even if you're just gonna let it sit in idle and neutral, you want to make sure and snap that main clutch back in that's going to protect everything in there and keep it all in good shape. Now to steer, that's where this lever and this lever come into play as well as the brake pedals on both sides, okay? So these are your steering clutch levers here and here. This right side lever controls power to the right track, left side lever controls power to the left track, as is the brakes. This brake pedal here applies the brake on the right track. The brake pedal over here applies brake to the left track. Pretty easy to uh, keep track of. 
So, say you have it in gear, your main clutch is engaged and you're moving and you want to make a turn. So if we want to turn to the right, first we have to pull the steering clutch lever back for the right side track. What that does is it breaks the transmission of power to the track. So now only the left side track is driving. And if you are on somewhat of a grade or you're you know pushing a little bit of a load usually all it's going to take to steer is just to break power to the track that you want to on the side that you want to uh, make the turn in if you're on relatively flat ground with no load just pulling the steering clutch lever back might not turn you that's where you need to use the brake then to assist in your turn and of course all the same things apply to the other side to make a left side turn you cut the power to the left track use the brake to steer if you have to Another thing that new um, Caterpillar or new crawler owners sometimes get confused on is if you're going to steer, you always have to release that steering clutch before you start hammering on the brake. Because if the steering clutch is still engaged, you can press that brake pedal as hard as you want. You're still going to have power to that track and it's not really going to do much for you other than wear out your brakes. And you know, when you're learning to drive these things, your hands and your feet can get awfully busy. And I did it at first too it gets to the point where I was starting to feather that brake pedal, not thinking about everything else that I had to, you know, going on. You always want to make sure you release the power first with the clutch and then you stab the brake in that order. And then you release the brake fully before you re-engage the clutch again. The final control lever to talk about is this one all the way to the far right on the fender. This is the control for the blade. So to raise the blade, you pull this lever back Basically, when it returns to its neutral position, the cylinders gonna, are going to hold whatever position they're in. To lower the blade, you push it forward. Return it to the neutral position. Your cylinders are again going to hold the blade in whatever position it's in. Now, there is a detent on this lever too. There's a third function. If you want to put the blade in the float mode, you go ahead and there's a detent that locks it in the forward position just like that and you just pull it to pull it out of the detent when it's locked in that full forward position that is float mode which basically takes the pressure out of both of the blade cylinders and really the only thing acting upon the blade is gravity or whatever ground conditions it's currently encountering now on a d2 on this d2 anyway about the only time i use float is when I'm going to like do some back blading. So in other words, if you want to make the area that you have to drive on a little flatter, or if you want to clean up a place where you've been dozing, back blading is a good way to do that. And what you would do is drive up over the ground that you want to back blade, basically throw it in the float position, let that lever stay locked ahead, and then you would back drag and that blade is going to follow contours and drift up and down as needed. Shave off your high spots, fill in the low spot, spots, and give you a lot flatter of a surface finish. So the only other minor controls that I want to talk about are the electrical controls. We're not getting into any of the starting mechanisms. I've done a thorough in-depth video on that a few years ago. I'll pop the link to that down below if you want to go watch that. So we don't need to cover that again. So your electrics here, I have the master switch on the battery. Up is power on, down is power off. So that's how you turn power on. This is the six volt system. It has the electric start for the starting engine. And over here, we have the gear drive generator and the regulator, and it all works. Um, your other electrical switch is up here on the dash. This is a multi-position switch, and I have it set up so the first position basically turns your gauge light on so you can see your gauges. Um, that's the only light that's on in the first position. Second position will also turn the headlights on. That's where I have it now. You can see we've got some light coming out of both of those. The old six volt system isn't great for projecting a lot of light, but it's in place and it works. Last position, it has all the lights on, which includes your dash light, your headlights, and rear fa facing lights. These are the brackets for those. I have those lights off right now, but that's why I put these little takeouts in there with quick connectors, made so you can only hook them up one way. Um, that's just something that uh, 
it's kind of nice to have if you have an implement behind and you're doing any kind of low light work. So flip this back all the way to the off position. And to kill your overall power, master switch back off. So that's pretty much the full rundown of the controls that's on this machine. So now that I've covered all the controls and their functions, I'll start this thing up and we'll go actually put them into practice. We'll uh, drive around a little bit and actually dose some dirt and I'll do my best to explain what's going on even over the noise of the engine.